This is a production of Cornell University. Um, okay, well, I, I am really happy to be back, though, here in the Cornell community. I've, as you can see, I have a real long history with Cornell and with lots of people here. So it's, it's great to be back and also great to be back in the Buckler Lab, working with my, my old friends and, and uh, with, with Tripsicum, wild relative of maize. So um, these are kind of what the, these were sort of questions I had when I first went to Simon. I, I had no idea what I was supposed to do as the head of a germplasm bank. So I had lots of questions. Um, and I, I would ask like, well, what, what would a global network of plant genetic resources look like? And Simit's germplasm bank is part of uh, an international network, but how does that function? Um, and how can an international germplasm bank uh, help smallholder farmers? Right? Part of the draw for me to go to Simit was, oh, I get to work with farmers. I get to help people after spending my whole career in academia, now I can actually help people. So I was really interested in how am I gonna do that? Um, this next question, is a seed bank a seed morgue? This is a big little a big issue that came up in the um, genetic resource community. And I'm gonna get into more details on it when I hit that part of the segment of the talk. And then um, at the end, I'm gonna talk about what were my objectives ultimately uh, for the time that I spent at Simit, and, and how did I do? Did I, did I reach those goals? And then at the end, some gratitude. So um, the goal is to have a fully secure and accessible plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, PGRFA. We talk about that all the time. The, the uh, international uh, banks of the CG system were mandated under the, the uh, treaty developed by FAO. So um, where there is a potential for a multilateral flow of germplasm and knowledge among the participants, and these participants are basically intended to be in a, in a grand sense, all human beings on earth. So the goal is this connected system where um, you could start with, right down to with a family, a family seed reserve, and that farmer could back up his or her seed in a community seed reserve in their own village. And that in turn, that collection could be backed up to be kept in a national or regional germplasm bank, which in turn would back up to perhaps an international germplasm bank or um, could back up in the big germplasm bank uh, above the Arctic Circle in Svalbard. But this was kind of, you know, uh, the, the big picture idea. However, the reality in, in 2021 is that these links are very weak, except for that last one. The link between the international banks and Svalbard is, is quite, quite strong. And um, also many national uh, systems like the US, for instance, they have a backup at Svalbard. So that is a very strong link. And I'm not gonna talk about that today. What I wanna talk about are the other links. So I'm gonna illustrate that with a story of a partnership that we at the Simit Maze Collection developed through a USAID funded project called the Buena Milpa Project with ICTA, which is the, the national uh, germplasm system of Guatemala. Asocuch is an NGO in this particular area of Guatemala. And the farmers that they serve. So we're gonna talk about how we develop this particular part of the chain. So we're gonna dive into the Western Highlands of Guatemala uh, over there where the little arrow is. It's a beautiful, the landscape is incredible. The, the mountains, the clouds, it's just incredible. But it is also a place with, with just incredible malnutrition and poverty. So the starting point is that um, traditional systems or traditional seed storage systems, the local farmers are actually limiting their food security in an area greatly affected by malnutrition and poverty. Community seed reserves could provide a very effective way to improve that seed security 
offering a safe, accessible source of high quality, locally adapted seed for annual plantings and in emergencies such as crop failure due to local weather conditions. And what I found uh, is that the people in these communities actually have a better understanding and appreciation for the concept of a seed bank than, than people in, in industrialized societies who have no idea, or they hear about Svalbard and they talk about Armageddon. <laughs> I, these people have many Armageddons every five years. They can lose their, completely lose their crops. So they actually, um, you know, there was a great appreciation for this concept of having seed banks. But when we joined uh, this project, uh, we were tasked with um, these questions. Are the existing community seed reserves in the Kuchimatanes Mountains in this region, are they living up to the expectations? And if not, how can we make them better? Now, those, there was a whole net, or there is a whole network of community seed reserves in this region functioning on over a decade of funding from the Norwegian government. They've put in millions of dollars to do this. And, uh, but, you know, they could always do better. And we were tasked with this, these questions, how can we make them better? So the farmer's methods of storing grain and seeds kind of look like this. Um, they use corn cribs called trojes or uh, metal silos. There are quite a few of those kicking around, usually not full of grain, but full of other things like clothing and, and shoes and things like that, but um, they also are used um, and they uh, store in the husk and, or in sacks, like you can see here. So the, uh, the community sea reserves, they offer an alternative storage option. And um, this is one of the inside one of those uh, community sea reserves and showing an example of what a local agrobiodiversity collection. So we're not only talking about maize, we're talking about all the crops and the medicinal plants in an area and they uh, make these generalized collections. But the, the core of a community sea reserve is this thing called the private accounts. And what, how this works is that when a farmer uh, harvests in January or February, uh, you know, of course they've got their grain for consumption and maybe a little bit for sale, uh, but they, they have the seed that they save for the next cycle and they bring it to the, their local community seed reserve. They have their own little uh, container. They take out the seed that had been sitting there for the year before, they put in the new seed and then they plant and the cycle repeats. So this is the basic way this, this functions. They have other services where they, some, some of them do um, mass selection, community uh, participatory breeding, and they do have improved seed also, uh, they have emergency grain in a silo, which anybody in the community can use in the case of uh, a complete crop failure. The problem, the problem is that these little houses um, are, have very high humidity and, uh, you know, they were equipped with all the basic equipment. And one of the things they had were hygrometers. They all had hygrometers on the wall. And as we were visiting them, we would glance at the hygrometer and we'd go, oh my God, 88% humidity in here. And um, that 59%, that was, that was like, wow, great. Um, but usually it was 88, 82 into the 90s. So this seemed to us to be a big problem. So the, you know, in this case, the relative humidity was 94%. And when we put these little indicator cards inside the flasks, everything's pink, okay? So even the seed is pink. And as we started interviewing people in the community series and asking them what their problems are, invariably insect infestations and mold, those are all problems for them. So this key fact is something that I always keep in mind that the longevity of seeds um, in storage, it's very, it's highly sensitive to both moisture content and temperature. And generally the duration, um, the seed viability is reduced by half for every 1% increase in moisture content or an increase of six degrees C. Now, 
So you can see that yes, temperature is important, but moisture level is critical. And during the course of building all these uh, seed reserves, there are about 12 to 15 of them. Uh, they got better and better at controlling temperature, but they didn't do anything about the humidity. So there's the problem. What would be an economical solution? And we came to the, the conclusion that, you know, remember these places don't have electricity. So they can't just whip out the dehumidifier and bring down the humidity. No, they can't do that. So um, how about if we try lowering the humidity inside those containers and not the whole building? Well, how could we do that? So at this time, um, I went back and I realized that I had heard something about uh, these things called drying beads. And so uh, lo and behold, in India, they have started using it in, in these things called drying beads. They're a desiccant and uh, require very little power to use. And I thought, hey, maybe this is something we should try to investigate. So yes, indeed, the drying beads, which we ended up calling cuentas secadoras, or, or also perlitas, like little pearls, we call them that too. Um, when you use these drying beads um, and keep the seed dry, they're completely resistant to insect infestation. And so they have this motto called make the seed dry, keep it dry. Make it dry, keep it dry. And, and that's kind of like their, the, the mantra of the, the dry chain. And this is something that was developed at um, University of California, Davis by Kent Bradford. And I started having discussions with Kent about how can we uh, apply them in uh, community sea reserves? That seemed possible. No one had tried this in all of the Americas. They were already using them in Asia uh, because the, the person who, the innovator who realized that drying beads could be used for seed drying, uh, he's based in Thailand. And so they had started using them in Asia, but they had not started using them anywhere in the Americas. So we said, hey, why not? Let's try it. Let's see what we can do. So we also needed a fast way and inexpensive way to monitor the humidity. And um, the Hort lab at, at UC Davis had developed these things called dry cards, which are fantastic and work quite well. Of course, we had to test it. We're not going to just go into something without testing it. In the, in the gene bank at Simit, we had um, a grain where we measured the, the humidity with our own instruments. And then we put the cards in. And what you can see is that they really nicely do uh, cover the range of um, where you want to be. So you want to be below 12% grain humidity. And you can see that, that they do. Um, really monitor that and track that. So we also needed a way to monitor the seed viability where everyone in the community could see it. And uh, while we were on a, one of our trips, we noticed that uh, in some, some of the farmers had, had sand benches, right? And we thought, cool, this would be a way where we could plant out the seed that we dried in different ways and show people in the community how this works. Also, I had had some experience with sand benches uh, working in my first maize genetics lab. And I also knew that a certain person named Kevin Ahern had <laughs> the sand bench hole puncher. So when I came home for a home leave, I, I stopped in with Kevin and he graciously lent me his one and only sand bench hole puncher, which makes 50 seed plots. I took that thing back to Mexico. I took it to Guatemala. I took it all over the place. And we eventually built our own. And I gave Kevin back his. Um, but uh, we uh, used, incorporated this into our experiment. Um, also, our seed conditioning team needed to kind of redesign the lid for the, uh, that they, they were using because the, the lids are opaque of the ones that they use in the uh, in the seed reserves, and in order to monitor, you want to be able to not have to take the top off. You know, you want to maintain whatever the humidity is in there. And so, um, one of our our team built they they made this uh, this new new setup. Um, so we decided to do in 2019. Um, also, the other piece that that happened is um, since I was two years out from um, from uh, 
retiring, um, I, was, I was given the opportunity to have a postdoc, which was fantastic. I wish I'd had postdocs from the get-go. Anyway, um, but uh, I got this great postdoc, Filippo Busson, who's a, a seed biologist, and I convinced him he needed to go to Guatemala, and he was all for it, so we were able to you know, get this going. So these are the hypotheses we wanted to test. Seed quality and viability are maintained better when the seed is dry with drying bees. Very simple, very straightforward. Seed quality and viability are maintained better in hermetically sealed containers. Also straightforward. And seed stored in community seed reserves is maintained better than seed stored in family seed reserves. In a number of the communities, people were not fully convinced by this whole community seed reserve thing. And so we felt that this is part of our, um, you know, we're doing what they call R4D, research for development, which means you're not, you know, away from people. You are working directly with people, with farmers, and you need to understand what their needs and communicate well. So um, that was another thing we needed to show that, in fact, using community seed reserves is a good thing. So uh, this is uh, our experimental setup each, and we, we um, worked in three different communities. In each community, there were two types of reserve. There was a reserve, a family reserve, the farmer family, and there was the community reserve. We had three treatments, and those are having seed in net bags, having seed in a plastic flask that has not been dried, and also having seed in the plastic flask that has been dried. So this is, the, this is the basic setup. And each of those little sets went out to these different locations. And we also put a data logger in, in every location uh, to keep track of um, temperature and humidity. And um, that's how we, we got going. These communities had three pretty different environments. Uh, High, high altitude, kind of a little bit medium, and then more tropical in San Francisco. And so uh, colder to hotter, less temperature to more temperature variation, um, more or less humidity. So these were different, quite different environments. Here we go, the sand bench hole puncher in action. Uh, we made our own sand bench at Simmit. We, of course, we have to try it before we go out and do it. So this was us uh, doing our first, our first setup. So you see each, each one of the little plots, 50 seeds and, um, no, 100 seeds, sorry. Uh, and uh, so there we go. And now this is what it looks like in situ. So this is like gorilla science here. I, we are out there um, doing what we have to do where in any way we can do it. But here we have the, the three sand benches in the three, in the three communities. We had to have covers on them to keep the chickens and the dogs and everybody out of there. Um, we did the humidity monitoring um, by visiting twice. At, we set it up, then at three months, and then at six months. And each time we downloaded the data from the logger uh, to keep track of that. And um, as you can see, um, in the beginning, uh, if you look in this side, you've got the, the pink cards in, in the flask where the seed has not been dried, and the blue cards are where the seed has been dried. Okay. Uh, we did uh, grain quality measurements, and this is the counting percent of intact seeds from a random sample of 100 seeds. So th those are the, the kind of data that we were collecting. And here, let's look at the data. So um, this is what it looked like just for seed dried with seeds and stored in hermetic flasks. So this is the best possible situation. And as you can see, after three months, after six months, it's, it's good. There, there are no statistical differences between those three data points. And this is, this is for, our, um, for that, that treatment. So there we go. OK, what happens if you don't dry the beads and you put them in a hermetic flask? Well, <laughs> all those eggs that went in there and did not get killed they're, they're hatching and they're destroying the seed, okay? And it gets worse and worse depending on the heat, depending on, you know, San Francisco is a more tropical location and we're, we're practically down to nothing by the end. The other thing to note is that the, there was no difference 
between what was going on in the, in the community seed reserves and in the farmers. That's why we combined the data. So it was a very simple story here. Um, the net bags was a little, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because the net bags, of course, they're exposed to the insects and the, and the temperature, but they're also, there is airflow. And so in fact, in some cases, the net bags did not great, but they didn't do too well, too badly. But the, the pattern was slightly different depending on the environment and depending on you know, how, how much insect pressure you had. Um, the seed quality uh, also, same, same deal, uh, but what was, happening, what was happening there was that uh, there was a little more nuance, um, in, especially in the tropics. There were, there were differences between what happened. It was much worse, much worse in the farmer's seed reserve than, than in, the, in the, um, the community seed reserve. So bottom line here, uh, our hypotheses, our results, uh, yes, yes, using drying beads in hermetically sealed flasks, always the best, in no matter what the environment, what the reserve type is. Um, so is seed quality and viability maintained better in a hermetically sealed container? Only if you dry the seed first, okay? Um, does the seed do better in the community seed reserves? Not necessarily, and it depends more on the storage quality, okay, how good the farmer's uh, reserve is, but also the, the community seed reserves definitely shows some technical advantages. For instance, the, the temperature was much more, much lower and more stable in the community seed reserves, and, and there was more consistent pest control. So still the community seed reserves are a better bet. So now this is what we ended up, this is what we are proposing now for the community seed reserves. A, a few more steps in here. When, they, when the farmers arrive with their seed, they do a dry card test to say, okay, is this water dry? If it's dry, great, put it right into the private account bucket. If not, do go through a drying cycle. In, um, this, is, this is a dry store cycle, uh, silo for drying. Uh, and then once it is dry, it can go into the flask and then it have monitoring. But remember the monitoring can be very simple can be once a month, look at the card. Is anything wet? Is anything dry? If it's wet, put it in the silo and dry it down. If it's dry, fantastic. The thing you have to realize is all this work in community sea reserves, almost all of it is volunteer. And these are very busy farmers and these are very remote regions. When the farmers come and bring their seed, they have walked, many of them have walked for hours to get there. They arrive and their seed's wet, the guys at the reserve are like, oh man, this is wet. Can you like take it back home, put it out in the sun and bring it back? Invariably, they're like, no, I'm not gonna do that. So they have to have a way to get that seed dry. So this is, this is the, the setup that we, we, um, we proposed and we, we went back in the communities and talked about doing this. So in the case of Guatemala, we didn't only detect transfer, we also sent germplasm. And um, over the course of this project, we repatriated to the national system of Guatemala, 785 maize accessions that at one time they had, but they lost because someone turned off the, the generator and went for a week or so and they lost the, their entire collection. But we had the, the entire national collection at Cement and we were able to repatriate it. But the cool thing is that when we brought it back, it went to our collaborators who did regeneration nurseries there and were able to do a selection process to figure out what's the best germplasm. So uh, that was what we did. Now, now, after we had this great success, we're all excited about doing it in seed reserves. Um, what about using drying, drying beads in, in germplasm banks and, and breeding programs? Can we apply it? And why not? So um, we had a great example that we could use at Cent, at the tropical station, Agua Fria station. They had this huge old drying cabinet that was bought in 1967. So it was probably the first thing they bought for this station. Cent started in 1966. Anyway, the breeders had decided they didn't like this 
anymore because it didn't get hot enough. So they weren't using it. We asked if we could just kind of retrofit it and play with it. And they were like, yeah, whatever you want, take it. We don't care. So we decided to convert it with drying beads. So uh, you can see what we did here. This is kind of a side view. You see that they did a nice paint job. They made it look a lot better. Um, but we made the inside work better. And uh, we had to do a little bit of uh, work on the fan, but otherwise we were able to keep the, the air flowing. The air is flowing through the drying beads. So the air coming out at the other side is very dry air and we're able to recycle it. Um, so we use about four to eight kilos of drying beads and, um, and we did this experiment. So, so why, what's the problem? The problem for the germplasm bank is it takes us weeks to dry our harvested seed using unheated forced air in our drying room. So we wanted to try something different. Um, and, uh, but if we dry using drying beads and it's a rapid drying system, does that have a detrimental effect on the longevity of our seed? We're very concerned about that. That's what we're in this business for is to keep seeds for long periods. So what Filippo organized was doing a controlled aging test. And this is something that seed physiologists do. Um, what they do is they um, create the worst possible uh, situation for seed. They put seed in and then they, they do, um, they keep um, sampling at, at uh, time points and they look at, the, they track the longevity. So basically they're trying to speed up you know, we can't wait 50 years to find out that we killed all our seed using drying. We need to simulate that. So this is a way of simulating. It. This is the protocol that we used. You can see the seeds are exposed to 60% relative humidity and 45 degrees C. And this is what happened. When we did the, the set of seeds in, in uh, Agua Fria using rapid drying, it took us four days to dry that seed. In El Baton, which is headquarters where the bank is, it takes 21 days to get to the same. So we had these two sets of uh, seed. We did, uh, we looked at the longevity curves and we found out that there's no difference. So this is a very important piece of information because now we can, without problems, we can, without um, doubts, we can, we can now use it for germplasm banks. And reading programs too. So here's a story of seed banks or seed morgues. Major Goodman is a, a super well-known plant breeder um, and germplasm expert at NC State. He was a guru mentor of Ed's and many other people. And um, in 1990, he made this statement, which everyone in the germplasm bank world knows. Major Goodman says seed banks are seed morgues. It was very catchy phrase. Um, but when you look at the, uh, what he actually wrote in, in this paper, it's a little more nuanced, okay? And what he said was um, a germplasm system that merely acquires material and does not have facilities for evaluation and utilization is really not a system. And in many cases, I would maintain that that seed bank is a seed morgue. And that, that is, I, that I totally am on board with him on that. So of course, a lot of the work we did at Simmons had to do with evaluation and utilization was something that was part of how the bank began because the bank began with the starting breeding populations for Simmons breeding program. So here's Major Goben, even though he said bad things about, about germplasm banks, he and that's Garrison Wilkes, who's a Tia Sinte guru, um, they came to a meeting we had in 2016 of the International Maize Genetic Resources Advisory Committee. So this is something you've got to remember. When people start dumping shit on what you do, those are the people you need to be talking to because they are going to help you. You're going to help you get better. And so we, of course, had to have Major come and join us and criticize us and, and give us uh, challenges. And we still love him so much. Anyway, so... What, also, we decided to uh, do a project where we understood better what, the, what our seed's doing in the bank. A scheduled monitoring system for seed germination had not been set up at, at this germplasm bank. This, now we're talking about CIMIT, the International Germplasm Bank. 
until 2012. So it wasn't me, it wasn't like my arrival that said, hey, we gotta have Germany. They had already started, but it was 2012 when scheduled monitoring started happening. So really there was a lot that we didn't know about the collection. So um, we wanted to compare, we have two different kinds of, of vaults, active chamber and uh, base chamber, two different temperatures. We wanted to see, it, are there differences in the longevity of the seed in these two locations? Um, and can we identify groups or types of accessions that maybe need more frequent monitoring than others? Okay, we didn't know that, we didn't know any of this. Eventually, this is something that's in progress now, um, they want to look at, can we, can we uh, identify molecular markers that are associated with seed longevity? That's part of you know, the next, next stage of this project. Um, so eventually what we had was um, accessions from the base collection, the cold, really the cold vault, and from the active collection. And um, in 835 cases, we had the same accessions from both locations. So we were able to do a direct comparison. Uh, we also had to be careful about um, making sure that we had uh, accessions that had been, been checked when they entered the collection and then had maybe two or three monitoring um, um, tests. So um, this is the traits that we were measuring and longevity or aging rate, which is how, um, how slow or how fast the seed is aging. That was what was used for the data here. So the data collection um, was basically making what, what people in the bank called tacos. So making, making um, these uh, rolled filter paper seed germination, just like you know everybody did in, in kindergarten. Well, we do a lot of that in the bank. And, uh, scoring after one, after one week. And uh, this is the results. So very interesting. Yes, um, in the active chamber, and that's the chamber where we go in to get stuff, seed for distribution, uh, where it's a little warmer. It's, you know, it's around freezing, more or less. Um, we found that there was significantly lower uh, viability in those seeds as opposed to the base. So it made a lot of sense. We had no numbers, we had no idea. Um, we're pretty happy with these results because um, even, even for the, uh, in the active collection, 81% and it, our collection, 81% have, are, are good, have, have that level of viability, much better in the active chamber. And this was you know, the first time we had any idea about um, also looking at what traits are correlated with longevity, and we found that grain type and also seed mass were two, two characteristics that were correlated with, with long, the seed longevity, those two. And um, it turns out that flint seeds, which anecdotally people have said for a long time, they are longer lived and they are the ones that um, on average, they can have longer monitoring intervals. So this is the interval between when you do tests. So this was calculated and um, for them, it's about 20, 20 years. So the, you know, why would you do all this monitoring? Well, this will control how much regeneration you have to do. And that is, I, I often say to my staff, that's the most dangerous place but it's the most fascinating, interesting place to be is when you're regenerating an accession. Because on the one hand, you could lose the accession. On the other hand, you finally are seeing what that accession does, what it looks like. How does it, how does it you know, what, what is, what is it, its a phenotype overall? And so, uh, but you don't wanna have to do that too often, especially when you have um, a collection as large as Simmons. So here are the take home messages. The, the faster loss of seed viability observed in the active chamber, this suggests that the current seed conservation approach, which I have to say is very common in the international banks of using two chambers with different temperatures could be counterproductive. So using lower temperature condition in both 
in both of them is probably the way you should be going. Um, also, the finding that there are significant differences in seed longevity among the accessions indicates that there are different viability monitoring and regeneration intervals for these different types of seeds. So this was something we had no idea about. So I, I've been talking a lot about energy uh, and um, energy conservation. So I just last week, uh, one of my colleagues, Kai Saunder at, uh, at CIMIT posted this cool drone picture of, this is CIMIT headquarters in Mexico. And um, I think you'll notice that there's something kind of interesting on the roof of the CIMIT. And um, there you see the little yellow circle, that's where the vault is. That's where the CIMIT seed vault is. The red circle is, hey, solar panels makes a lot of sense in Mexico. And uh, by putting in these solar panels, we had a 70% offset on the electricity. And also at the same time, we kind of greened up the system and the bank by, um, by changing out the cooling compressors and making them ozone compliant and more energy efficient. So uh, this is the way we, we dealt with that. So when in 2016, um, the whole genetic resources group got together and we were tasked with coming up with our, you know, what's our objective? Each scientist had to get up and say, this is my objective and this is what I'm gonna do. Now, I didn't wanna do that. I thought that was really hokey. But in the end, it actually was a good thing uh, because when I was retiring from CIMIT, I was able to go back and say, hey, what were my objectives anyway? And so my big objective was to pass on a better bank to my successor, okay? Better than the one I found in 2012. And these were the things I said I, was, I needed to do. The Green Global Database, it had to be fully operational. This was the goal. Um, the regeneration success of these accessions had to be at least 75%. I needed to have a complete set of CIMIT maze lines, all available for distribution. Big goal. Oh, well, there are over 600 of them. That there are no skeletons in the vault. So, like, there's no backlog of unknown materials, bags of stuff that we don't know what's going on. Um, there was a lot of that when I got there. Um, completely relabeled flasks in both the vaults with functioning 2D barcodes, okay? And I wanted to leave behind a team with enough experience, enough dedication that they could even run the bank themselves without a curator. So how well did we do? Well, fully met. Grin Global, we were one of the first international banks to take it on, to really, really use it, started using it in distribution, and then all the functions of the entire bank got on board and it's fully functional. Um, we got up to 79% in 2019. That was really exciting. Um, yeah, we almost have all the CML available for distribution, very close. Um, no skeletons in the vault. There is still a backlog. We had, we had a two thirds reduction, but everything is there. We know what it is. And it's also in the active process of regeneration. Um, the late relabeling of the flask just took a hit because of COVID. Um, so we only got about one third done on that, but we had to, we had to put that aside uh, and focus only on distributions during COVID time. Um, and the last one, the team with enough experience, I, I feel like, yes, I did that. Um, we have a team that's super dedicated and, and ready to, to do the whole story. I mean, it may be a bit boring, uh, not having a curator around, especially one like me who's always coming up with crazy things. So um, here we go with gratitude. I have lots of people to thank our, all our partners in dry chaining. Um, we hope to keep going with, with a number of them, but uh, we had quite a few. Um, also my, my key collaborators, Kristen Zavala is, he's the gene bank coordinator now. He was my, uh, my head assistant and he did everything and he was involved with all these projects and everything having to do with the bank. Originally for maize, now he does it for everything, for maize and wheat. Um, Carolina Camacho is a, a colleague and dear friend of mine in the socioeconomics program and every project we do with farmers, I work with her. Um, Filippo, of course, you've seen his great work. 
and um, I couldn't do this seed work without him. So, um, and also this is the staff um, of the entire bank, both maize and wheat team. Um, the tallest maize there is Hala maize, and that particular plant is uh, five and a quarter meters tall. Um, and the tallest human there is Tom Payne. He's the wheat curator, um, and he just retired this last month. So, uh, of course, we couldn't do any of this without money. So, um, and we really, really appreciated the guidance of the Crop Trust. They are the people that manage the, all the um, operating funds of the banks, and they really are, give us a lot of good guidance. Um, and thank you all. Thank you for your interest. And um, I hope you enjoyed this crazy talk. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, questions would be welcome. Thank you. Questions? Tim? Uh, simple question. Are the drying beads silica gel? And if so, or uh, how do you regenerate them? Um, no, they are not silica gel. It's a special kind of ceramics. And ceramics, ceramics they're, they're like clay beads. And, uh, but it's zeolite. And the thing about zeolite is that the pores are the size of water molecule. So the water molecule goes in and cannot get out, it gets trapped. The way they, they get rejuvenated is put them in an oven. So heat them in an oven at uh, 250 degrees for two hours and you recover them. And um, that was a very interesting side bit, which I knew I didn't have time to do, although it's funny because we try, we're trying to figure out how are we gonna regenerate or re, uh, reactivate the beads you know, in the Kuchimatanish mountains. And it turns out that every village, somebody has a, 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 a gas generator um, operated oven for bread. So we were able to do it using one of those ovens. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it's possible. And uh, yeah, that's how it works. Thank you. OK. There's, oh, can you uh, click on the chat? Uh, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what more? Going to another question. Um, in the seed bank, where you had, said you were using the dry beads uh, to dry things down, why not? I mean, obviously, you had electricity. Why not use something like a, a high efficiency heat pump uh, instead of dry beads? High efficient heat pump. Well, with, um, I mean, the, 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 um, the standard method for, for, for uh, maize and most things for long-term storage is to not use heat, is to avoid heat. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, for the breeders who only need the seed for, you know, a couple of years, that could work. Um, this might be a cheaper way to go, but yeah, I mean, that, that's a possibility, but, but people stay away from heat when-, I mean, when the heat pump wouldn't necessarily be, I mean, it could it'd still be kind of like household, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is most places have their, their drying chamber from the 1960s right. still, you know, so yeah, um, in order to make it more efficient, you got to go some different route, but yeah. Okay, I got the questions up somehow. Um, <laughs> Okay, one of the questions from Zachary, any thoughts on efficiently managing pollen contamination with wind pollinated crops? <laughs> um, well, you know, we, there we did exactly the same thing we do here in the genetics labs, uh, um, nurseries, you know, we, we did complete covering. We did, uh, we did um, just exactly like, we we do here so and everywhere so we you know tassel bags shoot bags you know completely manual i mean that's the difference between wheat regeneration and maize regeneration it's a, it's a the order of magnitude difference <laughs> how many accessions tom Payne and his crew can do a year over what we could do in a year and it was always like ah, i can't keep up with that at all um and they could like a year off, you know, we're like, what? That's, that's not a concept, you know, take a year off. Um, so, um, 
nothing, nothing out of different out of the ordinary. We were doing the same, you know, same bags, loss in bags. I mean, they, you know, same thing. Yeah. Another question was any idea on what percentage of cement maize germplasm is being used by African breeders? Ooh. Um, well, I mean, the cement maize program is based in Kenya. Okay. And so uh, they have, you know, complete access to cement maize lines. And, you know, we, we, whenever they need supply of that, and we, we send, we send, uh, you know, whatever they need, whenever they need it, they mostly have, they can regenerate their own stuff there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a question for the breeding program, but yeah, I mean, there's a very active breeding program and they, they use cement, cement maize lines. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about whether you, uh, you would say that Africa has land races, okay? Africa has had maize for 500 years. So that's a thousand generations. So I would say that they've got some land races there. And, um, IITA, which is the uh, in Nigeria, uh, they have a maize program there. They're they're the only other um, CG international uh, system that does uh, institute that also does maize um, besides cement. So um, you know we have a complete backup of their plush, and they they did they did collect um, from you know what you could call land races. So we have some of that material. Um, so there are connections for sure. It, it looks like Lee Cass has a lot of questions about the beads. So maybe you can, some of them you've already answered, but maybe you can follow up later with okay. her on the cost of beads and would they be appropriate to be used in an herbarium um, in the tropics? Um, there's another question. Um, are all cement accessions stored at negative 15 C today instead of negative three and negative 15 C? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you probably didn't notice, but uh, the entire collection is in the base. The active collection, there, there are some cases where we don't have it in the active, but we do have it in the base. Um, so ev everything in the collection is in the base. And then a, a high proportion are also in the active. But um, like even if, you know, the, in the experiment, we had a thousand accessions that came out of the base and, um, you know, 800 or so of those. Uh, we're also inactive, so there there is a little bit of a difference there, but everything in the collection is is in the base. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Has the questions about the beads? Um, are there any significant bottlenecks with the manufacturing of the beads? You said it came from one central place in Thailand. Do they have the if, if you were to mm -hmm. supply all these regional? And local germplasms or, or seed banks also, uh, when they hit the scale of production, are you kind of at their whim as to supply of, the, of, the, of these uh, beads? Okay, so the original use for the zeolite beads was to get water out of oil. So this this was from the oil industry. So there is no like bottleneck there. I mean, the oil industry has a lot. I mean, but I mean, not a lot, but they, you know, there's a lot of those out there. The innovator who said, hey, we can use these beads for drying plant material in Thailand. He has his own company and he does all this fancy, fancy stuff. Um, there is now a distributor in the US, Dry Chain America is a distributor of, of all things related to, to uh, drying beads. Um, but if you go online, and you look for zeolite beads, you can get them. You know, I mean, I don't know if Amazon has them, but <laughs> but uh, you can get them. I mean, they, they come from China, so uh, you know the the guy in Thailand is always trying to kind of keep a lock on on people who are using it for drying plant, but he can't. I mean, plant material. So um, this was a big deal for us. We had a, when we did that experiment in Guatemala. We could not bring the beads in unless we had a special permit because the beads don't exist in Guatemala. We had to have this special uh, registration thing and we couldn't get it. And, and um, 
I, it delayed the experiment by a year. And then when Filippo came, I said, hey, Filippo, how about if you and I carry them in a backpack over the border um, from Mexico to Guatemala? And he was like, cool, let's do that. So we did that. So we actually smuggled into Guatemala, right? Um, <laughs> We call it smuggling for good, you know. I mean, there were a lot of people going the opposite direction with other things, <laughs> but we were going to Guatemala and we were bringing, we were going to save the farmers of Guatemala. So um, we can get them in Mexico, though we can we can order them and get them from Mexico. And especially now, we, our first shipment came from Thailand and like double the price of them. But now they come from the U. They, there's a distributor in the U.S. Dry Chain America, and you can get them from him. So. All right. Well, I have one final question. Where do you think germplasms need to be going in their future to really become, instead of being these morgues, uh, places where innovation is starting, but is not the end of the mandate to just keep them, the seeds rejuvenated? Uh, well, you know, I like to have fun. I like to work with the farmers. And so I just like, made time to do that right but as you can see i mean the reason why i include that last bit where i'm showing my goals and doing it is because there's a lot of stuff to do there's a lot of maintenance to do so you have to have a good well-trained team you have to have everything you need i mean you need a man a really strong mandate and i have to say that over the you know the eight years i was there we did have a you know the funding stream was was pretty solid and um and we were creative. You know, one year, the GIZ German government people said, we are not going to give you our $300,000 this year. And we're like, what? And, and they said, we want to fund technology. So Tom Payne's like, let's get solar panels. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the Germans love that kind of stuff. And yeah, we got solar panels. You know, you have to be like creative. You have to keep keep moving like that, you know, and, and trying to find a way to do it. And I, I think that's, that's the only thing. It's just, you know, just keep pushing and, and keep your priorities really straight in your mind. No, I don't want my seed bank to become a morgue, of course. <laughs> that should be top priority there. Uh, but I want to make sure people can use it and know about it. You know, like I was telling Moira, I, so many farmers, when we talked to them, they were like, they had no idea there was something like that in their country. And um, so we need to get out there and talk to people and, and really, uh, you know, make it more accessible. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. If we could give Denise a round of applause. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Denise. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.